right. Well, it's four o'clock, so I guess I'll get started. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Kapadia. I am a physical medicine and rehab physician here in Dallas. Um, I work at Pelvic Rehab Medicine, where we treat all sorts of chronic pelvic pain for both men and women. Um, and one of the things we see greatly in our clinics is um, endometriosis. And so that's what we're here to talk about today. It's Endometriosis Awareness Month, and you can never have enough awareness of endometriosis. So today, Dr. Haverland and I hope to bring a little bit of insight into this chronic inflammatory disorder and hopefully be able to answer your questions. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Haverland, who I'm so excited to be here with today. She is a board certified gynecologist here in Dallas. Um, she specializes in endometriosis and excision of endometriosis. She did a minimally invasive fellowship at Mayo Clinic, and she just recently opened a clinic right down the street from us um, in Dallas. It's called the um, the Highland Gynecology Group. And so I'm really excited to introduce her and have her join us in this discussion on endometriosis. So Dr. Haberland, I um, will give it to you to get started. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Dr. Kapadia. I think this is so important just to talk about endometriosis, women's issues in general, but especially endometriosis because a lot of our patients haven't been heard. Um, and endometriosis is very common. It's one in 10 women have endometriosis. So terrible, painful periods, pain during intercourse, pain even, you know, with bowel movements or between periods is not normal. Um, mm -hmm. If you've been told it's normal, <laughs> you need to come see one of us because endometriosis <laughs> needs to be um, more common and more physicians need to learn about it, more patients need to advocate for themselves and we need to advocate for them too. So I think this is uh, really fitting, you know, being Indo Awareness Month in March that we can have this kind of uh, discussion of um, pelvic pain and endometriosis because they, they tend to go very much hand in hand. Uh, yeah. You know, we were, we were talking and endometriosis, not only is it common, but it's also common in pelvic pain. So um, in my training at Mayo, we said about 60 to 70 percent of women with pelvic pain was caused at least in part by endometriosis. So sure, there's other avenues that could cause pelvic pain, but endometriosis is certainly at the top of the list. And if not treated appropriately, um, unfortunately, it could just kind of linger, al linger along and then your symptoms don't necessarily improve, even with you know, other you know, forms of treatment that are appropriate. But if you're not um, kind of getting to the source of uh, the pain, which is the endometriosis, then, you know, sometimes uh, you're kind of stuck in a, in a wheel without improving. Yes. And so um, one thing that I learned in fellowship, especially at Mayo Clinic, was excision of endometriosis. So we don't burn lesions, we don't cauterize lesions. And the reason is, when you excise the endometriosis in the pelvis, you really understand how deep the lesions go, how... Um, and you're able to remove all of it. So if you see just a spot on the top and you burn it, that's not necessarily removing all of the disease that's underneath. And you don't know if it's underneath if you don't go searching for it. And there's been some studies, especially in the fertility world, with endometriosis resection and better outcomes. Right. And so we kind of um, have this philosophy, which you and I share, which is so fun to find so quickly in Dallas. Um, of endometriosis resection, uh, removing all of the areas in the pelvis, the peritoneum that, that can cause um, pain or where endometriosis tends to live, especially down by the uterosacral lig ligaments, the ovarian fossa. I usually remove sections of um, kind of the uh, rectovaginal septum there and then also above the bladder. Yeah, great. So yes, definitely agree with this excision philosophy. Um, we see a lot of patients who have unfortunately been through 
so many surgeries in the past and have had ablation. Um, and we talk about how ablation definitely has a higher chance of recurrence yeah. um, than excision. And so what we see is there's in general with excision surgeries, we see better outcomes in terms of their, like you mentioned, fertility and pain levels, but also in terms of all the symptoms that we'll talk about that occur because of the endometriosis. Yeah, um, sure. So um, just just to kind of give us a background, Dr. Hiverlin, can you kind of explain what endometriosis is? Um, and and I think it's a very um, underspoken subject, and I don't think that all, um, I don't think we know enough about it or exactly what it even is until, unfortunately, our patients go through it. So. Yeah, endometriosis needs much more research. Uh, I mean, it is, um, it's a debilitating disease and it affects a lot of women. Um, but essentially, it's ectopic endometrial tissue that implants not in the uterus. So it can implant um, there in the pelvis, on the ovaries, on the bowel, um, even on the diaphragm, in the liver, um, really anywhere in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Um, and there's a lot of theories as to how this happens. Um, but we see endometriosis in young women who have never had a period, and we see endometriosis in postmenopausal women who are done having periods. So the theory of retrograde menstruation, um, where the, the endometrial cells come out through the fallopian tubes and implant, is kind of debunked. So we think that it likely is kind of a, a genetic, rather through the lymphatics or the bloodstream, similar to how cancer spreads. Um, and it sort of implants along um, the pelvis and the abdominal cavity. And when these endometrial lesions are places where they don't belong. They cause a lot of pain, a lot of inflammation. They can cause problems with, you know, voiding or going to the bathroom, um, having bowel movements, intercourse. Um, and all of these um, issues, you know, affect your quality of life and are very important. Um, some women, you know, when they have really debilitating disease, um, even have issues with, um, like, with their lungs and coughing or pain in their diaphragms. Um, and that can be, you know, really severe. Usually when I, um, just to go back, you're talking about excision and recurrence. I usually quote about a 20% recurrence at five years with a good surgery. So the goal is always to do, do it once and do it right. So a good excision surgery. And I, I hope that, um, you know, once women come in and have the appropriate surgery, that's not something that they have to continue to do, you know, going forward. Yeah, definitely. And that's something that we'll also touch on is, you know, once you have the excision, like Dr. Havon said, you, you want to do a one and done surgery. Nobody wants repetitive surgery. Um, and of course, unfortunately, post surgery, you still, we still are seeing um, post hysterectomy or post excision uh, nerve pain and musculoskeletal pain. And right. that's kind of where we team up and work on um, providing them pain relief post-surgically so that we're not having to send them back to surgery. So we'll definitely touch on that. But um, just to kind of go back to what you were saying about the period-related pain, um, one thing that we've noticed a lot in our patients is that previously, way back when, we were noticing that endo was more defined as a cyclical pain with periods. So the pain would go up during menstrual cycles, and then it would kind of it would kind of wane during the period in between cycles. Um, but now, unfortunately, we're seeing that it's, it can be acyclical pain also. So is that something that you kind of see and agree with? And are you seeing more acyclical patterns of endometriosis now too? Yeah, absolutely. Especially um, the most common thing is, you know, I started my men's days around 11. And initially I had terrible, painful periods. And then after a few years, I just had pain all of the time. And that's kind of that central sensitization of pain, the musculoskeletal pain, the nerve pain that, that you help us with. Um, but you see as your body has, you know, been, been beat down by these terrible um, pain symptoms and the pain receptors kind of get overwhelmed, uh, at some point your body just, you know, doesn't really know how to react. So it's having pain not just when you're supposed to be on your menstrual cycles or the endometriosis um, really can flare at any time, unfortunately. Yeah, and that's why we actually have been seeing, we're di still diagnosing endometriosis when 
of course, in the 20s and 30s, um, female population, but also uh, as they get older into the 40s, 50s and 60s, we're still diagnosing new endometriosis that may have caused so many um, issues in that, that lady's life previously, but they never attributed it to endometriosis. And then when we do a full workup, um, they're found to have endometriosis. So right. definitely something that we're hoping to start diagnosing earlier rather than waiting till they go through all these years of pain and discomfort before they're diagnosed with it. Yeah, I definitely think earlier optimization of care leads to better outcomes. Because if you can catch somebody younger and really work on those pain receptors and, and treat the underlying cause, you know, they still have a lot of years ahead of them and they can um, really just learn from their pelvic floor physical therapy and, and these treatments, uh, a way to manage and hopefully, you know, rather pain free or much less discomfort than they were having beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. And just to kind of give, um, our audience kind of a, an idea of how common it is. Um, I know you have spoken to me previously about just the statistics of how po how common endometriosis is within the chronic pelvic pain world. Um, and so do you know those numbers? I mean, I know. Yeah, so I well. usually quote 60 to 70% of women with chronic pelvic pain have endometriosis. And so if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I have pelvic pain, it's just unbelievable how many times that endometriosis really isn't even brought up. And it should be one of the, you know, the highest on your differential mm -hmm. um, of why are they having pelvic pain? Why have they had it since they started menstruating around 11? You know, which isn't always the case, but so commonly it is. Um, mm -hmm. And then, so chronic pelvic pain, 60 to 70% of women, and then about 50% of infertility is related to endometriosis as well. So there's so many reasons why endometriosis needs to be studied and, and really brought to the forefront. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, just speaking of fertility itself, I mean, that's a whole different conversation in itself. But just to briefly touch on it, I think so many of our patients come having gone through so many treatments prior to actually being diagnosed with endometriosis that if they had possibly had an excision of the endometriosis rather than going through all these um fertility treatments, then we could potentially minimize what they're doing in terms of conception as well. So yeah. I think, I think just er like you were saying, optimizing early diagnosis is huge. And we yeah. have um, a, a large par portion of our female patients, when they come in to see me for their initial evaluation, I almost think to myself that when I hear painful periods or early menarche or just uh cyclical or acyclical pain, I'm automatically thinking kind of endometriosis until proven otherwise. And that's how I kind of approach their treatment. And even though the treatment protocol doesn't truly change from my standpoint, I think it's nice to have that in the background of my mind so that when we're progressing through their treatment, having a consult with somebody like you or having some support from a certain endosurgeon's like you, um, I think we're able to speed up that process of diagnosis and treatment. And so yeah, I think so too. And really just, you know, getting the word out, having people understand that, you know, we believe them, we know their pain is real, and kind of helping, you know, guide them in the in the right direction to get help. Um, I mean, that's, that's the number one step. And again, just advocating for more endometriosis research and research and pelvic pain also, but just kind of getting uh, the word out, not only to our patients, but also other physicians of, you yeah. know, why it's important and um, kind of where to, where to send people when they, you know, seem to have some of these same complaints. Right, right. And I think, um, I think realizing that surgery doesn't have to be a big, bad, scary word. Um, yeah. But I don't think that comfort level comes until the patient is really heard and mm -hmm. their concerns are really validated. And knowing that we understand that surgery is not a piece of cake, but it could be a source of huge relief. And so, um, so yeah, so we appreciate, I mean, I really appreciate having surgeons like you who take out time to speak to the patients before just, you know, taking them back to the operating room. Yeah. And endometriosis is so 
so difficult to diagnose. Um, you, you know, you have a high suspicion based on, you know, complaints and kind of patient symptoms. But, you know, the official diagnosis is technically surgery. But one nice thing about surgery is it's not only diagnostic, but it can be curative as well. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get everything at one time. And while right. surgery is not, you know, risk free, we do do this all the time. And um, just giving patients some um, support, answering all of their questions, uh, you know, letting them know that we're not going to leave them when, when surgery's over and we're going right. to be there with them before and after. And I think that really, really helps just knowing that there's options after surgery that, that they can follow up and they have a, a plan. It's not just surgery and done. Yes, definitely. And I think that's where I appreciate having um, kind of a team-based approach because sure. we see a lot of patients after they've had surgery for endometriosis and even a lot before they've had surgery or before they've been diagnosed. But um, our protocol or our treatment comes in when a lot of post surgery or post excision nerve pain occurs or musculoskeletal issues occur that eventually lead to these uh, symptoms that you were mentioning earlier, like um, constipation or pain with intercourse or pain, continued pain with periods or trouble conceiving, um, pain with sitting, pain with exercise. Um, you know, a lot of our patients just have trouble having a proper quality of life because their bowels, bladders, bowel and bladder are affected from this excision. And so we really focus at PRM on restoring that quality of life. So I always tell my patients, you know, um, I would love to take your pain from 10 to zero overnight, but that's obviously not going to be possible um, in a day. But as a physiatrist, as a rehab physician, my goal is to provide you restore your quality of life. And so for us, that entails being able to go to the bathroom without being in pain, being able to spend time with your family without having to be in this chronic pain, being able to do the things you love without perseverating on pain. And pain with intercourse is such a huge thing today for women who feel like they just have to live with it. And yeah. um, that's, that's not true. And so we really focus at PRM on restoring that quality of life through our protocol, which includes a kind of a combination of medication, physical therapy, and then we have an injection protocol for the most severe cases. So um, I know that we've talked about this, but our protocol works well when you've gone through the excision surgery and then you have follow-up with, with, with us at PRM mm -hmm. and you kind of optimize their outcome after the surgery as well. So um, what, I guess, at what point would you clear your patients to to kind of pursue this treatment. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Dr. Kapadia, with the with kind of the, the team approach. Um, I, I also wish I could take your pain completely away. Um, and sometimes I can, but, but typically when patients have had pain for so long, they have underlying myofascial pain and musculoskeletal pain and nerve inflammation. Um, usually I would recommend them following up with with you maybe four weeks after surgery and then starting mm -hmm. the nerve injections anywhere from, you know, around six weeks, five to six weeks, um, depending on kind of how their recovery has been. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think the, the four week mark is kind of when we would start the treatment, but I think mm -hmm. um, even just having a discussion after surgery would be something that we could do before, you know, before the four week mark as well. Um, I also had a question for you in terms of what kind of is your, just so our, our audience knows, what kind of is your, um, your schedule or your regimen on how you approach evaluating the patient? So when they come to you, um, what are their options before surgery? What, what, at what point do you consider surgery? And then what kinds of things do you do, um, before you before you actually do the surgery. Yeah, well, I think the most important thing is just to listen to them and get their story because so many times they haven't been heard or they have 15 minute appointments with the doctor and they um, really don't feel like their concerns are, are being listened to or their um, complaints. And so that's the biggest thing, it's just to listen. But pelvic pain, the same, the same symptoms you mentioned, pain with intercourse, pain during, during um, 
their menses. You know, a lot of them have tried all sorts of medications. I've tried 10 different birth control pills. And then, you know, my doctor tried to put me on Lupron or Alyssa. And, you know, the side effects were really terrible for my mental health or um, the, those are kind of the, the stories that I get. But, but first line, I just listen. And then I talk to them about options. So medication like birth control pills, it is an option for people that don't want to have surgery. Um, mm -hmm. If you're, you know, really against surgery or you have, you know, high concerns, we can try medications and sometimes they work uh, for at least a short amount of time to, to help with some of your symptoms. And I think that that's reasonable. Um, but again, it's sort of putting a Band-Aid on the underlying cause. And really the underlying cause is endometriosis and, and the gold standard of treatment is excision. Um, but I certainly am open to listen. While I'm a surgeon and I'd love to do surgery, surgery isn't for everyone. And so I do um, lay out all of the options, including medical options. Um, medications like Lupron, I'm very hesitant to use just because of the side effect profile. Um, but for, for a select few, it might be a good option. Um, but coming in, so the first um, visit, that's kind of what we, what we talk about. We get all of the history, we go through the options. And then my exam is, is probably very similar to your exam, but um, you know, I do an external exam. I feel the muscles inside of the pelvis, um, check for myofascial pelvic pain, you know, palpate the bladder and the rectum and the uterus, check for you know, ovarian masses or to see if the uterus is scarred down or you know, the ovaries are scarred down and they're not, mo not mobile. And then, you know, then we kind of talk about imaging. You know, imaging is an, uh, is an kind of an added um, physical exam. So my physical exam is what I go off the most. And then we kind of talk about imaging, which I usually get some sort of imaging prior to surgery, rather an ultrasound or an MRI. Right. Right. Yeah. And we, um, I, I agree with that approach. I think the pelvic floor is, um, so is a is a unique part of our bodies where just doing an exam can show us a lot, and so that that's definitely a huge part of my initial uh, consultation with my patients as well. Where you do a pelvic exam, you know, just a manual finger exam, but you can feel the tightness of the muscles, you can feel the rectal muscle spasm, the vaginal muscle spasm, you can feel their inner thigh muscles, their tailbone is you know tender, their hips are affected, and so you learn a lot. Lot from, we learn a lot from the exam and we're kind of able to direct where we really need to focus on, all right, after you've had excision, where do we need to focus on restoring good blood flow and cutting out that inflammation? And so yeah. um, and par part, of our, part of our treatment also includes what you were mentioning is down training the nervous system, that central nervous or central uh, sensitization that happens over time. It's kind of like, I give the example, it's kind of like being punched in the shoulder for so many years where the brain just starts perceiving that area to just constantly be in the state of pain and inflammation. And so part of our treatment with our endometriosis patients is to down train, calm down that nervous system, bring it down to baseline so that your body is not always in the cycle of pain. Um, and so we also just, you know, with the imaging also, we, I do often um, obtain MRI pelvises um, just to kind of rule out any underlying internal issues besides just the musculoskeletal aspect. And that's kind of when we can pick up on inflammation that may be coming from something like endometriosis or adenomyosis or anything that's beyond just the external musculoskeletal issues. Yeah, um, I, agree. I agree completely. Unfortunately, yeah. imaging for endometriosis is not ideal. Right. <laughs> um, so many times we get an MRI and it says, you know, all the organs, you know, look, look clean. And then you get in and it's just terrible, like an obliterated cul-de-sac, endometriosis all over the pelvis. Mm -hmm. um, and same thing with ultrasound. Uh, the ultrasound, you know, doesn't always pick up, um, you know, endometriosis unless it's really thick plaques. But one thing I definitely use the MRI for is um, finding lesions in the bowel. I do feel like the MRI is better for helping me identify um, at least large lesions if they're invading the, the lumen of the bowel. Right, right. And so you have also mentioned that um, when you do excision surgeries, you'll bring in a colorectal surgeon if you do see bowel lesions. Is, is that something you find? Yeah, absolutely. 
if there's um you know lesions superficial on the bowel i can take those off but if we have to enter the lumen of the bowel or any type of bowel resection um mm -hmm. we have colorectal surgeons that we work with um to help us with not only the surgery itself but also the post-operative course right right great great yeah um i mean i think endometriosis like we said is is extremely common and unfortunately you know that's why we're here talking about it, but hoping to yes. bring awareness. And I think another um, kind of section of management of the inflammation and the treatment is um, it's not a cure all, but as a functional medicine specialist, also, I always like to discuss anti-inflammatory diets with my patients and just right. lifestyle changes. Um, and so huge things that I always mention to them is cutting cutting out or minimizing refined sugars, caffeinated beverages, um, spicy acidic foods that is essentially going to trigger more inflammation in the pelvic floor, irritate the bladder, irritate the pelvis, and that's just going to exacerbate your symptoms. And so um, there's a lot of research and data out there now that shows that endometriosis obviously won't disappear with these these dietary changes, but you can definitely post-op minimize your inflammation after surgery um, or even just going into surgery to improve your outcomes as well. So um, I think that's just something important to touch on as well because sure. I think our our society is going more towards, you know, we, we don't like to take all the medications in the world. So I think diet and lifestyle changes can definitely help yeah. with I, inflammation. Yeah, I agree completely, especially for long term. I mean, if you can make it a, a habit, which I know takes, mm -hmm. you know, takes time, but changing your lifestyle, making it a habit, I think the long term outcomes are just extraordinary with mm -hmm. diet change alone, which yeah. is harder than harder than you think. But once it becomes natural, I think to patients, they it's it's much easier. Yes, 100%. Yeah, great. I saw a few questions. Do you have yeah. questions on there? I do. Let me try to just go back and see if I can find any. Um, if you see any before I do, you can feel that free to find. <laughs> I saw one that asked, um, how much pain should you expect after an excision surgery? Um, mm -hmm. And that's really variable. Um, it kind of depends on... Um, like the extent of the surgery, if you have lesions that are um, superficial or if you have lesions that are really deep and we have to, you know, dissect out like some of the sacral nerves um, or, you know, really dissect out the bladder or even take out a part of the bladder, you know, an over so it can cause, you know, quite a bit more um, irritation after surgery. So that's not a good answer, I know, <laughs> but um, it's really variable to every person. I um, tell my patients, you know, I want them walking the same day. I want them eating a regular diet the same day. I want them moving as much as they can. It helps with just the muscles not getting so tense after surgery. Um, and usually narcotics are used, you know, the first few days, 24, 48 hours. You know, but some people don't need any and some people need them for a week. So it kind of depends on where, where your pain is, you know, before surgery as to how well you recover also. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's also important to note that, pain after surgery is normal. Um, obviously, it's not a nice normal, but it's, <laughs> it's going to occur. And so um, you're definitely not alone. And that's, that's where we come in and we like to deal with that pain and down sensitize those nerves that are over firing after surgery. I mean, it's normal when you cut into the pelvis or whether it's minimally invasive or if it's a large incision, it's still going into our bodies and it's creating inflammation, it's creating scar tissue. And so um, minimizing that through, you know, pelvic floor therapy and um, diet changes. And then obviously, the protocol that we do, it tackles the nerves that are affected in the surgery. We do um, injections into the pelvis that allow that inflammation to go down and those muscles to relax after surgery. Right. And so all of those things exist because we know pain exists after endosurgery. And so um, if, if you do have pain after surgery, you're not alone. And there are treatments for that. And like Dr. Berlin right. said, 
um, narcotics is normal post-op for a few days. Um, but long-term, we don't want you relying on those. And those just create more constipation and more inflammation in the future. So we like to help you come off of those and then give you more holistic ways to manage the pain that's going to occur for a few weeks after surgery. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Um, Long-term narcotic use is uh, it's just a slippery slope and it, it tends to cause more, more trouble. Um, yeah. And so if we can, you know, minimize the use after surgery, which is normal again to mm -hmm. use, but um, long-term use, I, I agree completely. Yeah, and I, I'm not a fan of throwing medication. I, I know you aren't either at, at patients, but one thing that I do highly um, use in my patient population is our suppositories. Right. And if we do need to use, you know, heavier medications, getting into things like gabapentin or Valium or things like that, we tend to use them more through suppositories because you're not getting all the side effects through your entire body, but you're getting a very local effect through the vagina or the rectum and there's high blood flow there naturally. So it's getting absorbed and it's reducing all the inflammation and tension in that area without giving you, you know, all the systemic side effects. So there are options out there. I, I think, being able to discuss it, like you had mentioned, taking out more than five minutes to talk with your doctor. I think that is key to finding what's going to work best for your body. Um, yeah. And so I did see another question that was earlier. She said, um, I have chronic pain with nerve damage post hysterectomy. I also have endo. Have, I've had an ablation. Do you have any advice? Oh, that's tough. Um, I think if you haven't had an appropriate excision surgery, that would be my, my, my go-to because again, it's treating um, the underlying issue instead of kind of putting, putting a bandaid on it. Um, treating it with excision surgery may not fix the nerve damage, but it can fix the underlying cause of some of the inflammation. And then we can go to Dr. Kapadia with a um, pelvic rehab and, you know, talk about treating those specific nerves and the inflammation there. That would be yeah. my recommendation. Yeah, definitely. And kind of stemming off of that, um, there was another question that's, uh, she asked, what do you do for an irritated pudendal nerve? And pudendal nerve is one of the biggest nerves of our pelvic floor. And it comes from our lower backs. And it's one of the most commonly affected ones when there's any sort of chronic pelvic pain. And endometriosis very often um, affects the pudendal nerve, whether it be before surgery or after surgery, um, especially as Dr. Haverlin was saying, when, when the endo enters between the sacrotuberous ligaments and the sacrospinous mm -hmm. lig ligaments, that's where we're really getting into that pudendal nerve irritation. Right. Um, and so that's something that, you know, I see every day and we have different ways of treating it, like I said, through a suppository to reduce that nerve from over firing. Um, to kind of minimize the pain receptors on that nerve. But also through pelvic floor therapy, there's pudendal nerve release exercises, which your therapist can teach you about, which we can talk about, that really help to just basically stretch that pudendal nerve and restore its mobility so that it's not always hypersensitive or it's not firing out of, out of sync. Yeah, I am a huge proponent of the suppositories. They can really help with postoperative pain, um, they're easy to use. Patients can use them, you know, regularly, um, or if they kind of have a flare. I just think I just think those are really a great asset to post-operative pain and just long-term management. Also, mm -hmm. definitely. I think that I think you just answered the next question. It was oh. um, how do you minimize or treat post-op neurogenic pain and inflammation when anti-inflammatory medication isn't working. And that's absolutely right. The anti-inflammatory medications kind of act as um, a band-aid to the inflammation and kind of reduce the firing temporarily, but you're not really cutting out that inflammation. So um, I think using a suppository to really help that blood flow restore to that area, because with blood, comes oxygen and oxygen is what we our bodies need to heal that area right. so that's why both of us are huge uh, proponents of suppositories rather than just oral anti-inflammatories yeah i mm -hmm. i agree completely and maybe that's the reason why i need to make sure that some of the patients come see you before surgery so they can yeah. kind of get those 
not only the discussion of how to manage the post-operative issues, but also, you know, let them know about the suppositories and, you know, what options they have. Yeah, 100%. I call it, um, we call it prehab and post rehab or prehab <laughs> rehab and post rehab. So basically you get the best outcome if you are priming your pelvic floor before you go into surgery and after you go into surgery. So that's where we love our pelvic floor therapists also because they really help to give you a good uh, home program where you can really prepare your body for that inflammation that's going to come from the surgery when you're cutting up the endo. So yeah. definitely a huge proponent of people seeing me before surgery and after surgery to really optimize their outcomes. Yeah, I, I agree. And also with uh, physical therapy, like you mentioned, you know, learning how to kind of relax the pelvic floor even before surgery can help with some of those, you know, the immediate tension afterwards, just kind of learning, learning to breathe, learning relaxation techniques, I think is, I think is really important. Yeah, that that's huge too. We we all we, I always suggest a good mindfulness and yoga program because that just helps to desensitize the nervous system as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a huge mind body component in endometriosis and pelvic pain, so it's not just about tackling the problem in the pelvic floor, but it's a it's a whole body issue. And so, right, holistic yoga, mindfulness, relaxation, even diaphragmatic breathing is. Yes. huge in terms of desensitizing the whole nervous system. Um, Dr. Hibbon, there's another question for you in terms of, does a hysterectomy help with endometriosis? You know, that is the age old question. Um, you know, when, you know, 20, 30 years ago, everyone would just do a hysterectomy. If you had, you know, pain um, in your pelvis, let's just remove everything and see if it gets better. And that's, that's really not the case. If you have adenomyosis, or something else specifically affecting the uterus, then a hysterectomy um, can help your symptoms. But endometriosis itself um, is not cured with removing the uterus or any other organs in the pelvis for that matter. Um, the ovaries for women are very important, not even just when you're in your 20s, but there's long-term studies that removing um, the ovaries even before 10 years after menopause, so up to around age 60, has poor long-term outcomes with bone health, heart health, dementia, um, even all-cause mortality. So even reasons we don't know, um, you just, you need your ovaries. Um, and so I'll get off my soapbox there, but <laughs> also very similar with, uh, with the uterus. Um, if you have, you know, fibroids, adenomyosis, another reason um, where the uterus could be causing you pain, um, or, you know, if we can't stop your periods, um, then, then a hysterectomy is, is potential, but it's definitely not first line and not for endometriosis. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to get right back on your soapbox because <laughs> I am a huge believer that, um, as physicians, you know, as a, as a, as a whole group of physicians, I think sometimes we, um, say, Oh, if it hurts, you know, take it out or remove it or cut it out. We don't need it. It's no big deal. We're just removing something we don't need. Um, but I think removing any body part, whether it's your appendix or whether it's your uterus or whether it's your gallbladder, you're taking out a part of yourself and you're taking out a part of your body. And it's it should never be something that your physician or your surgeon undermines. Um, removing a part of you is a huge deal. And so that's where I, I felt from the first time I met Dr. Haberlin, I was touched because I think she doesn't take it lightly. And I think you should never have to remove something you don't want to remove or you're not comfortable with removing. And so um, whether it be from adeno or fibroids or whatever, I think you should be able to have a full discussion with your physician or your surgeon and be able to talk about your comfort levels on removing something that's yours. And I think um, that's where I know Dr. Haverlin spends a lot of time talking to you about that. Um, as a patient. And I think that if you can't find a physician that's willing to take out 20 minutes or 15 minutes of their time to talk to you before they want to remove something, I think that's your right to find somebody who will. Yeah, I, I agree completely. You, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, any other questions? I mean, I think, I, I think we covered most of them. But. I see one thoughts about birth control pills after surgery. Um, 
you know, hopefully if you do a good excision surgery, um, you don't need additional medications, but birth control pills can be good for, for a lot of things. It can help with acne. It can help make your periods lighter um, or more regular, say if you have PCOS or other reasons why you don't have regular menstrual cycles. Um, but I don't, I don't tell my patients they have to have it. You don't have to have birth control pills or an IUD or something after surgery. With a good excision surgery, um, you don't necessarily need medication um, additionally. Now, if you want contraception, then you know we'll, we'll talk about other options. But for endometriosis itself, I don't think it's I don't think it's an absolute necessary. And then, what are some what are some common misdiagnoses? I mean, oh. Um, Let's see, the one I hear all the time is, oh, my mom had painful periods, so I have painful periods. Mm -hmm. It's normal, or um, that's, that's the most common one. Or, you know, my doctor told me that all women have periods like this. So that's my biggest misdiagnosis that um, yeah. frustrates me. But, um, you know, IBS, irritable bowel mm -hmm. syndrome, is certainly something that is um, very common in patients with endometriosis. And so that's, that's a similar diagnosis. Same with interstitial cystitis. Um, endometriosis on the bladder can, can affect some of the bladder functioning and voiding. Um, and so endometriosis on the bowel or interstitial cystitis a lot of times are, you know, kind of go hand in hand. Um, ovarian cysts um, sometimes are not related to endometriosis, but um, like follicular cysts or, you know, dermoid cysts. There's a lot of uh, different pathology on the ovary that can also cause pelvic pain. Um, besides mm -hmm. endometriosis. And then, you know, there's so many uh, nerve issues, you know, like, you know, pudendal neuralgia, myofascial pelvic pain. Um, and some of these are misdiagnoses, but some of them just kind of go hand in hand. When you've had mm -hmm. pain for this long, likely the endometriosis is also causing myofascial pelvic pain and, you know, inflammation in the nerves. So a lot of these uh, diagnoses and symptoms sort of come in a, in a package deal, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, we call um, uh, interstitial cystitis and endometriosis, sometimes they call them like the evil twin sisters. Um, yeah. Because we, and, and a lot of times they're misdiagnosed with IC, but a lot of times they will have IC, but it's also related to endometriosis. And same with um, PCOS. We see a lot yeah. of patients that have recurrent ovarian cysts, like you mentioned, um, and they're just told they have PCOS, PCOS, PCOS and they're on birth control. They develop diabetes later in their life, but really it's the recurrent cysts are actually endometriosis lesions. And right. so um, I think that's huge. And again, PCOS is very often diagnosed in teenage years, but we're not really looking deeper for um, is that endometriosis related or not. So yeah, I agree mm -hmm. completely. I'm mm -hmm. glad you mentioned that because a lot of women um, have been true or falsely diagnosed with PCOS when they when they see me um, mm -hmm. because it's kind of a, a fallout diagnosis. Um, if you have yeah. irregular cycles, well, you know, this is common, so <laughs> it could be, yeah. could be your option. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think there's another question for you. Why would we see infertility even with stage one if it's not on the uterus or ovaries? Yeah, well, so a stage one would be diagnosed with surgery. So all of the staging is diagnosed surgically um, with endometriosis. And so hopefully you would have a surgical resection of the disease and know that you, at that point, are stage one. And you don't have to see infertility at that point. Studies have shown with good endometriosis resection, you have better fertility outcomes. Um, unfortunately, though, if you've been trying having unprotected intercourse for you know six months, timing, you know, your timing is appropriate. Um, at that point, you, you may want to start to have a workup. Endometriosis lesions can implant um, on the fallopian tubes and inside the fallopian tubes, sometimes causing um, pretty significant inflammation, which affects um, the egg when it comes from the ovary, also affecting the fertilization of the embryo. Um, so endometriosis, um, while it has better outcomes after resection, sometimes that can that can be um, one of the causes that you can't necessarily see um, surgically because it's more microscopic in the fallopian tubes. And the, um, the IVF doctors have kind of ways, ways to manage that or, or they'll talk to you about your options there. 
Mm -hmm. And I think any stage endometriosis shows that there's an imbalance of inflammation in the body and that can lead to hormonal imbalances, which can lead to also me metabolic issues and all those things, you know, everything has to line up perfectly for conception to occur. And so I think if you have even stage one endometriosis, it's probably worth your while to have your thyroid checked and your Absolutely. Uh, hormonal levels checked and, you know, just work up all those other labs that could be affected by any hormonal issues because it is an inflam inflammatory disorder. And one area of inflammation in the body probably means there's inflammation elsewhere. Yeah, well. I agree completely. And similar to how endometriosis affects pelvic pain. So you can have stage one endometriosis or stage four endometriosis, and you may have similar pelvic pain or symptoms. Mm -hmm. That's unfortunately similar in infertility as well. You can have stage four endometriosis and have you know, issues with infertility, or you can have stage one, or just, you know, a lesion, you know, somewhere else, and, and that you can still have, have difficulty. So um, that's another area where we just need more, more research and more um, options for treatment, hopefully going forward. Yeah, definitely. And the next question kind of carries into that as well. Um, can, can endometriosis start at any age? And I think um, this is a good, good place to also say that some people with endometriosis will not have infertility issues and True. they will have, I've, I've had multiple patients who have come in and said, I've had four or five children. I never had issues conceiving, but now all of a sudden they have a flare up of pelvic pain. They have pain with intercourse. They have trouble um, going to the bathroom and then they were worked up and sure enough, it's endometriosis. So it absolutely can flare at any age. I'm, Dr. Haberlin can speak more about this, but um, from my experience, I've seen that, you know, people may go 20, 30 years without anything. And then in their forties and fifties, they're diagnosed with endometriosis. Um, it really yeah. just depends on how your body reacts to that inflammation and when it really flares up. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, occasionally, not commonly, but every once in a while, I'll go into surgery for a patient with, you know, a large cyst or nothing, something that's non pain related, and they'll have terrible endometriosis, and they don't really have symptoms. Now that is rare. But endometriosis is such a spectrum. Um, and I think, um, yes, it can occur at, at any age. So I agree with you completely. Uh, sometimes, you know, it'll flare, you know, once and then for 10 years, you'll be fine and then can come back or when you're younger, you don't notice symptoms and or after childbearing. Um, so really, it's a very interesting disease that we just need to learn more about. Definitely, definitely. Um, I, I really hope that we've been able to bring some sort of awareness and re and, and hope, I think, because I think uh, when you jump from physician to physician and you're told that there's really nothing that can be done. Um, I think it's very easy to lose that hope and just feel like you have to live with that pain. But um, I think Dr. Haverlin and I have tried to shed some light on the fact that there are options and there are solutions and you can have a better quality of life um, between surgical management, medical management, physical therapy, um, just rehabbing the pelvic floor and the body in general, because endometriosis is so much more common than, you know, our, our society lets off. And I think um, it's important to know, I mean, there's so much research coming out still at this point, but I hope that we've been able to provide some sort of insight and hope for our patients and our um, women that have been living with these kinds of symptoms. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pony. I agree completely. I mean, quality of life of patients is so important and just letting them know their avenues to help them and, and physicians that will listen to them and just letting them, letting them know that, you know, these options are here, not only in Dallas, but, you know, in other areas around the country too, of, of people that know how to treat endometriosis and, um, you know, have, have a team approach for the best outcomes. Yeah. Definitely. Well, we're so excited to have you in Dallas now and um, a surgeon who not only specializes in removing endo, but just the holistic care of our patients. Um, I always like to tell my pa or to, to tell my patients that, you know, I, I real I understand that you don't care how much I know until you know how much I care. Um, and so I think that is 
what I see in Dr. Haverlin as well. And so I really look forward to hoping uh, to treating more endo patients with you and hopefully finding out more about this disorder so we can send it to yeah. the curb. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm looking forward to working with you too. I really think that we can um, improve our patients' lives and, and kind of give them their lives back. Really. Yes. Definitely. And I know there is a question about um, whether this is going to, this talk is going to be saved or not. We, we will save it as long as techno technology works. <laughs> um, but it will be saved. And if you, if anybody has any other questions that we weren't able to answer, feel free to message us through one of the, one of our accounts and we would love to chat more. But thank you so much, Dr. Haverlin, for being here today. I know you're a busy, busy lady but uh, we really appreciated your time and I really look forward to working with you yeah thank you Dr. Claudia thank you for having us in the public rehabilitation center for for hosting I appreciate it of course good to see Bye. you good to see you <laughs> have a good night thanks everyone bye